these students have been left out completely in the online line. Now, this person gives us in our survey says, look, you have lockdown in Nairobi. We are out of Nairobi. We need material to learn. That portal is not for us. So we literally need physical material. We have to spend our own extra money out of the fees and everything we have to make. For example, if you're blind, to have that interpreted in Braille and brought to you outside Nairobi because you can't even enter Nairobi. And you're expected to learn and undertake these assignments and listen, just like all the other people who are online. And I think it's, it's shameful for us to do this to our members of the society who are really, really, really eager to be part of our legal education. It is terrible. It really, really, you know, you know, hurt me so much uh, that, that we have left out our, 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 our students with disabilities in our online uh, learning. And, and there is no even much input in terms of, of the law schools themselves in terms of catering for this demographic. And this demographic is growing so much over the days. And so now I get towards the end. And this is library resources. And this is where we, I, we really had a, a big problem. And in library resources, you notice that the online subscription of, of materials online by law schools was not very good. In many law schools that we even asked in our survey, LexisNexis is not even part of what they can access online. And so we said, why don't we look at the financial statements of universities in terms of how much they allocate to library resources? Unfortunately, when, when most of the universities we looked at, we couldn't tell what is allocated to library resources in terms of online resources from the library because the financial statements just write a single you know, figure of what library is buying in terms of books. And, and it looks like both e-journals and, 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 and physical books are listed as one uh, item. And so we couldn't tell. But at least from our data, then we can tell that you know, uh, uh, there is no much money that is being put to online resources. And if you're going to have a blended system of learning going forward, uh, especially with what we don't know will happen next year with the new variants, then you need to invest more in online resources than in physical books because no one is coming to your libraries anyway. And in many law schools, in fact, the libraries were closed. They're not even open. So the access has to be online. And so this is something. And so what do they, we think then should be, you saw the next slide, and this is where we, we want to go. So this concept of eutagogy is the concept of modern uh, adult teaching. And, and you see, you know, what we're used for is the pedagogy and the andragogy of, you know, teaching based either from the academic perspective or, you know, a middle of it. But eutagogy focuses on teaching uh, in terms of centered learning. So the, the learners should guide how the teaching should go forward. And a good example of a university that has adopted this is uh, uh, Oxford with their BCL program. They, they, they do this field target teaching, and it's mostly a round table. So what a lecturer does, records a 10-minute video where he speaks about you know, all the issues, major issues that he wants, sends it to the class. And then when he comes to class for the online teaching, instead of you know, sitting on a screen and talk, it becomes a, a round table discussion because they say, uh, the University of Geneva and the Graduate Institute of Geneva jointly conducted a research that shows none of the students was willing to listen any further than 45 minutes for online learning. And so what they did for longer classes of two hours is after every 45 minutes, they cut breaks. So we think this uh, provision of eutagogy will, will go really forward. Now, lastly, as I conclude, uh, next slide, uh, is exams. Uh, and, and, and the reality is that exams will have to evolve. If your teaching has evolved, uh, your exams cannot be the same. Uh, and, and online learning is showing a lot of exams problem. You have a lot of exam malpractice. Uh, you have uh, either, either students, you know, getting people to write for them or, you know, this open book. And that's why I put this meme here. You know, when you are doing physical exams, you get 29. But when you're doing online exams, you get 92 every time. Because So more of open book exams and more of, what Maurice O'Dwyer and Tom Ogenda argue of clinical legal education in terms of testing. So our, I, our suggestion is that increase the marks for oral exams, maybe at the Kenya School of Law, to maybe 30, and you increase also the marks for the uh, project uh, exams to maybe 30, and then you reduce now the marks for the sitting exams. Because then if your mode of teaching has changed, your mode of examination cannot also be the same. It's just, it's just logic that you know you put in this sitting exams, none writing, and your mode of teaching is different. 
And lastly is we looked at India as a, uh, as a comparative, uh, so next slide, as a comparative uh, area which has, 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 has undertaken, you know, uh, 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 developments of legal education training in, in terms of, and we chose India because of this. We didn't want to choose the US or the UK because those are developed economies. So you want to choose something that is more local, you will understand and you will relate to easily. And India provides, you know, the best. It's an extremely good legal education system. It, they have some of the best academics and lawyers that you find today. And so the Bar Council of India has developed, you know, guidelines for universities. In fact, the Bar Council of India say, said that the students would graduate even without doing the exams. And what they said is, if, if we are unable to offer the exams as they were, then what we can do is we can go for the pass or fail system. Yeah. So if, if for example, you give a, a, a cut and, and you determine that in terms of pass or fail, instead of, of grading in terms of numbers. They also told, you know, uh, 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 law schools to provide, you know, periodical reports in terms of how to do that. So our recommendations are, which is the next slide, our recommendations, you know, are we think that, you know, while we've done this research, we think there is need for more research. CLE and law schools should engage in more research in terms of, of looking and studying how to improve. And this research must involve both students and academics. It cannot be one-sided. And then CLE must provide, you know, clear guidelines of blended learning because the reality is that next year things will not be the same. And then we also think there should be more emphasis on students with disabilities. Uh, academics and uh, law schools should find more attractive uh, areas of teaching and uh, also traditional ways of exams. So those were our, our views and our, our issues. We'll be happy to, you know, to share our data and our survey. Uh, we're still, I'm still trying to, to map out more graphs and you know, getting into the nitty gritties of, of the minute details of, of that survey. So thank you very much and uh, uh, thank you for listening. So last slide. Um, thank you so much, John Yanje, for that presentation. Um, at least for the first time, we have moved from pedagogy to andragogy to hutagogy, whatever that means. <laughs> um, I think this morning is going to be largely about uh, legal education in Kenya and um, how to adapt to uh, uh, COVID-19 challenges. And the recommendations, I think, were there, very wonderful and excellent. Uh, some of it were not well known to me. The next aspect of um, assessment of uh, the impact of COVID-19 on uh, legal education in Kenya is by um, Fad Moyomba. Moyomba Fad is my name. I teach at uh, Mount Kenya University Parklands Law Campus. And uh, I'll be, unfortunately, I'm not able to project, but I'll proceed. My topic is uh, assessment of uh, COVID-19, its impact on the legal education. I, I particularly had a focus on the Kenya School of Law and Mount Kenya University, where I teach. I teach uh, ADR, refugee law, and forced migration. The aim of this uh, paper was basically to assess uh, how are we affected, not just uh, the university, but staff and students. And therefore, I'll be sharing with you a few of the experiences and challenges uh, uh, in, in, within the two institutions. Period of research was uh, March 2020 to October 2021. I will skip the nitty gritties as to when uh, COVID uh, was detected for obvious reasons. And I'll go straight into how we were impacted. Global response. So we all remember that uh, flights were canceled in most countries. And with that, studies were equally affected. That means uh, for most of us, or for most of the students who are seeking to study in this country or out of this country, they could not get visas. Uh, I think for staff, most are likely to be pursuing PhD programs or masters, they couldn't proceed uh, for that reason. And of course, there was international change of uh, priorities. In Kenya, we vividly remember the lockdown and its impact. I think for starters, 
there was a government directive for people to stay at home. By that, we all uh, had to just be at home and do nothing. So I think uh, that to some extent impacted ideally everyone within the sector. Curfews followed, cessation of movement, learning institutions were among the first, in, were among the first to be affected. Then there was the introduction of uh, what the government called containment guidelines or rules, which required strict implementation of, of, of among other things, physical or social distancing. Now, if you come from a university, especially to give an example of a public university, where a number of students is huge, uh, KSL in mind, you can imagine that uh, the challenge the campus had to go through to make tough decisions. In fact, in my research, uh, Kenya School of Law was among the institutions that were greatly affected. They took almost the longest to make very uh, tough decisions on the way forward, mainly because of numbers and uh, compliance. Mount Kenya, what was the response? The Senate sat and made uh, some resolutions that affected Mount Kenya University, including installation of a new infrastructure to support physical, to support uh, virtual learning, and a lot of money was required. Our data showed that over 50 million had to be invested in this. We had to be taken through training. Most of us are not uh, tech, 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 tech savvy. So, having taught for so many years, when you are required to transit to a new system, it was very challenging to find, uh, you know, the students are the one now assisting the lecturer uh, to interpret some of these uh, things. Even, you know, appreciating the terminologies used in the virtual uh, system it took a lot of time. I think lecturers were the most affected. Uh, luckily for Mount Kenya, I think, and many other campuses, uh, MOU was signed with Microsoft uh, to, to, to transit to e-learning. Because of that belief that probably platforms like Zoom are not uh, designed for learners. And so the institution adopted it, and that's what we use to date. Mount Kenya University also partnered with a TV station by the name of TV47, where lecturers could then go and record lessons for them to, to be transmitted to students through the station. A partnership with Safaricom and Telecom assisted in reduction of costs of assessing uh, school bundles or internet. Uh, E-learning was uh, enhanced, particularly library being closed, so we needed to move to utilization of uh, e-library resources. Virtual classes became a norm, uh, at least for that period, for Mount Kenya, because I've learned that other institutions are still uh, having virtual classes. And uh, project supervision was suspended for a while. We took time to understand how to go about it. So student supervision was halted. Uh, so that means projects and thesis were halted for a while. But of course, after that, after realizing we would love to deal with this, then we embraced uh, the virtual learning, including graduation, which had, had, had delayed. And for the first time, we had that virtual graduation uh, towards the end of 2020. Negative responses. Number one, uh, these affected students. Judicial attachment was halted. Most courts, obviously following government directives, were not taking in students. Numbers were reduced, uh, which obviously meant graduation numbers were also, in fact, halted. I think there was a year lost. Fee defaults was uh, rampant. Obviously, parents, guardian sponsors were affected, so paying fee became a problem, which, uh, you know, also affected staff remuneration. I think uh, 
a number of uh, institutions took a cut. And when you take a cut, it also affects your, your status. I don't want to overemphasize that. Kenya School of Law, as I said earlier, was uh, greatly affected. The school was closed for the longest period. Uh, delay of exam, backlog, library closed, moot court halted because of a practical lesson. And of course, in both institutions, just like all others, uh, students were not able, not all students were able to access uh, due to capacity, financial and otherwise, because e-learning requires you to have a laptop or a smartphone, internet, data, and power. If you live in areas where these are perfect, then it became impossible. Luckily, some students reported back and said that, uh, at least I got this feedback from some students in Kenya School of Law, they found virtual learning to be convenient because students could study wherever they were. Classes are recorded. Classes are recorded. And so in case you miss a class, you can still go back and uh, you can still go back and uh, access your class. Cost of attending classes was reduced because then it meant you don't have to live in around Rongai or Karen. You can do your class, you can work. I think the, the students found this to be quite interesting. And interestingly, the performance, when the when, when results were released, it was noted that, uh, that uh, in a long time, the performance of students was the best in a very long time. So I'm yet to understand whether virtual learning is good for this generation. Uh, um, but at least what is factual is that uh, the pass rate for this year, the last exam was higher than before. Some of the challenges are cross-cutting. I've mentioned some. Feedback coming through students is very challenging. Sometimes you're not able to see the student. You don't even know if the student is attending class. Someone can actually sign in to a gadget unless you demand for, for video or, or other evidences, which is also hard. Exams are extremely difficult to conduct in virtual setup. It was very dramatic. Uh, documentation, sharing, had a lot of manipulation. Uh, I don't want to go into that. Tardiness in class, difficulty in tracking concentration is power cuts, shortages, etc. was a cross-cutting challenge. I think for our reference, uh, I talked about uh, uh, cross-border closures. Uh, this application, I think a number of lecturers were unable or were unable then to proceed and uh, you know pursue their PhD as per the timeline. But I think that is now getting better. Uh, jobs, internship, pupillage equally affected because right now if you go to seek a pupillage or internship or a job, Chances are you'll be told we had a vacancy, but because of government guidelines, we can't accommodate more than this number. In fact, most of our staff are working from home. So just try next time. So which is a cross-cutting challenge. Way forward. It, uh, it, it is obvious that uh, most institutions are embracing both physical and virtual learning, which is a good thing for staff. My colleague here yesterday told me that he was able to do this session here and in the evening 5.30 attend a virtual class, which is a good thing uh, because nobody is missing anything. There is need to continue investing in digital infrastructure. Uh, I think I'll also mention graduation. I think this is one of my favorite uh, outcome. Uh, we have a culture of having, whenever there's a graduation, there is always roadblocks with the whole village is moving towards one university. I think this is a very good outcome because then if I give an example of our campus, only select students are allowed to go physically and the number is very reduced and the people do graduate nevertheless. So I think this saves a lot of cost even to the economy. Government supports is obviously paramount. And there need to be a policy shift. I think the speaker before me mentioned about, talked about this. And uh, it's now easy, I think, to collaborate as institutions that are offering legal education. 
I think it's also time for institution to consider other incomes. Because with COVID, we realized that universities were investing and actually they were, they were, they were able to make uh, some monies from other non-primary non, non, non sources. And I, that marks the end of my presentation. Thank you. Is used as a regime maintenance tool. We don't have imminent uh, security threats that will warrant our, the budgets that we allocate to our military. And we seem not to get it right. What is wrong with the African person? Somebody who always tells me that the witch who, betray, who bewitched us in Africa probably is dead and we don't know where to get the charms from them. Anyway, my slides are here. In terms of socioeconomic rights, the UN Vienna Declaration and Program of Action, here and after the Vienna Declaration, this is a 1993 document, stated that all human rights are universal, they're interdependent, and they're interrelated. So, so there's a connection and a connectedness. And this is a global declaration by a preponderant number of states that these rights are interconnected, interdependent, interrelated. Therefore, we cannot divide the so-called first generation rights, the civil political, which we are doing badly as a country, as Kenya, and the so-called second generation, the socioeconomic rights. Ziko Sawa, they're interrelated. Now, the interdependence and equality argument between socioeconomic and civil rights means that these rights ought to be treated the same. And I have stated that even with the so-called first generation rights, the civil political, as a country, Kenya, we are doing badly. And this brings us to the context of our analysis, whereby we are looking at the case of Karyobangi Sewerage Farmers Self-Help Group versus the Cabinet Secretary Water, and Sanit Water Sanitation and Irrigation versus others. This was an, an Environment and Land Court petition number 11 of 2020. Briefly, in context, without the English, the too much English, this was a case by indigent persons around the Karibangi area of Nairobi. And they were represented by my senior and good friend, Dr. Hamino, and Caroline Odor. Caroline Odor is a, a lady practitioner, very good friend of mine in Nairobi. So we had two sets of cases. And when they approached the court, because these um, persons had been issued with very short notices, was it one week, for them to uh, vacate. For the Haminwa case, uh, Justice Okongo on 3rd May 2020 issued orders barring the eviction of these threatened indigent people until inter-party hearing. Inter-party hearing for the non-lawyers means that until both sides are heard. So that's a court order, a valid court order. Now, to our chagrin, and uh, I believe Dr. Rago will be coming in later, he's dealt with these matters much more. This order was ignored, and the state proceeded to evict these people on a rainy day. People lost their items, people were beaten up, uh, earth movers literally swept through uh, uh, this um, informal uh, settlement uh, in the wee hours of the morning while people were sleeping. Now, human rights, the dignity of these persons were certainly not respected. And the interplay between democracy, constitutionalism, the rule of law, came into sharp focus with this particular case. The state, the Kenyan government, was in focus here again for conducting these evictions 
during COVID-19. These are people who earn less than a dollar per day, probably did not have anywhere to go, and there, are no, there was no preparedness on the part of government. Where do we take these people? Do we have a decantation site for these people? Do we have food provisions for these people? And it was particularly disconcerting for some of us when we were treated to the images of women. I remember the particular image of a one mother clutching on her breastfeeding kid being rained on in the morning. That is the heartlessness and the recklessness that comes with persons in government. I am notoriously for speaking my mind when I'm in the spirit. Uh, the spirit of constitutional law uh, moves us to speak the truth and speak the truth to power. These evictions were conducted against the background of law and law policy instruments, international and domestic, that ought to have guided the state in terms of how to conduct evictions. Now, what is the law and policy with regards to eviction in Kenya? Very quickly, for purposes of time, the Constitution at Article 43, and ladies and gentlemen, when you read Article 43, please read Article 43 alongside Article 19, Article 22, Article 23, Article 10, a holistic reading of the Constitution. Article 43, as the starting point, affirms that every person has a right to the highest attainable standards of health, the right to accessible and adequate housing, and to reasonable standards of sanitation, to be free from hunger, to education, to social security, and to clean and safety water in adequate quantities. Now, a synthesis, a breakdown of Article 43 was attempted in the Mitubel case, and what I call the Mitubel explainer was given to us by the Supreme Court at paragraph 146. And this is what the court said, that the crucial question we must consider is when does the right to accessible and adequate housing accrue? So the court says that in the language of Article 21 of the Constitution, the right to housing being an economic and social right can only be realized progressively. This is what the court says in paragraph 46. Now, when you move to article, uh, paragraph 149 of the same decision, and after a series of uh, pronouncements by the court, the court says that from the foregoing, the question as to when the right to housing accrues, in our view, is not dependent on progressive re re realization. So the court contradicts what it says in paragraph 146. It says that the realization is not progressive, but the right accrues to every individual or family by virtue of being a citizen. It is an entitlement guaranteed under the Bill of Rights. So the question I had when reading this was, what is your position? Does it accrue by virtue of citizenship? Or is it progressive uh, in terms of realization? Paragraph 153, the court says that the right to housing in its base form need not to be predicated upon the title of land. And then the court proceeds to say that indeed it is the inability of many citizens to acquire private title to learn that condemns them to the indignity of informal settlement. The court uh, touches nerve, a raw nerve at 153. It was conservative in its language, but the truth that is captured under paragraph 153 is indeed there has been a neglect on the welfare component by the state that we have presided over an imbalanced state, whereby the gap between the rich and the poor is astronomical. 
the indigent have not been taken care of. The informal settlements are mushrooming. And Professor Lumumba, uh, in our side uh, discussion, will tell you that what the government does is this, and those in government, please forgive us, is that they come and pave roads. They supply a little bit of water here and there. And that will be called slum upgrading, slum improvement. So in essence, you are giving some lacquer, some veneer of, of, of sprucing up on these informal settlements without addressing the core problem. And that is improving on the houses, the living conditions of the poor people in Kibera, Mukuru, Mitumba slums. And it's particularly concerning that these demolitions continue to happen. We have the latest in the transaction being the overnight destruction of Mukuru slums. I don't like that term slum, so let me use informal settlement. The destruction of Mukuru settlements without giving these people alternatives. Now, where the government fails to provide accessible and adequate housing, the court says that the least it can do is to protect the rights and dignity of those living in formal settlements. It is not happening. The latest in the installment, again, I say it is the Mokuro case, where two weeks ago, people were uh, swept out of their houses, schools brought down, clinics. Now, for purposes of this discussion, these demolitions continue against the background, backdrop of recent amendments to the Land Act, Section 152B and 152C. And these amendments say this. Article 1, Section 152 says that an, an unlawful occupant of land, be it community, be it public, be it private, can only be evicted in accordance with the procedures in the Land Act. What are these procedures? Under Section 152, ladies and gentlemen, the National Land Commission shall issue a notice in the Kenya Gazette, local newspapers, and in the media, and give at least three months notice before evictions are carried out. The National Land Commission can then pursue eviction upon the expiry of the three months' notice. That is for public land. In terms of pub private property, the process begins with the property owner or the agents issuing these unlawful settlers an eviction notice of again three months. All other people, all other people affected should also be served with this notice. The notice should be widespread. Now, in addition to serving these notices to these people, these notices should also be filed in newspapers and should be followed up with radio announcements. We are all Kenyans. Do we ever see these notices? Apart from maybe the National Land Commission? No. You will meet police officers come to your property accompanied by our good friends from the Ministry of Interior. Police menacingly coming and clobbering people in the morning. And that is the norm. Notices are usually not circulated properly. The, the, the notices should be in the national language, Kiswahili, and should be shared with the Deputy County Commissioner as well as the OCS or the police division in the area. If this happens, I am not aware. Now, in terms of community land, that was in terms of private land, in terms of community land, the county executive in charge of land should issue the notice. And again, it has to be in the Kenya Gazette, it has to be in uh, newspapers, it has to be followed up with uh, uh, radio uh, announcements, and this should be in local dialect. 
So if you are carrying out uh, eviction in Moranga, Kagema, you should be communicating to these people in Ekoyo. If you are doing it in Yala, you should be doing it in Dolu. If you do it in Baringo, where my surrogate father, Mr. Rotich, comes from, you should be doing it in Tugen and explain to them that an eviction will happen in three months. Now, these procedures are quite elaborate. And they replaced what we call the Eviction and Resettlement Guidelines of 2009. The Eviction Guidelines of 2009 and these procedures suffer the same consequence. They are not respected. We go to court as lawyers. We seek orders on the basis of these uh, uh, procedures. Those orders, again, are not respected. A comparative experience. What happens in other countries? For purposes of time, we are supposed to be looking at Colombia and other countries, but for purposes of time, we we'll limit it to South Africa. Now, the process in South Africa, due to its colonial well, apartheid past, is a little bit more dignified. It's sanctioned and uh, what they call the prevention of illegal eviction from an unlawful occupation of land act. That is euphemistically called the PIE, P-I-E. Now, P-I-E draws from section 26.3 of the South African Constitution. Now, what does section 26.3 of the South African Constitution say? Section 23.6.3 says that nobody will be evicted from their home or have their home demolished without an order of the court made after consideration of all relevant circumstances. Please note the language of 26.3, the South African Constitution, that nobody will be evicted unless you are accompanied by a what? A court order. So court orders siyo gazeti ya kufunga nyama. Court orders siyo gazeti ya kusoma. Those of you in government, private citizens, a court order is authority. It sanctions. So under the, in the South African context, you have to get a court order and that flows directly from the constitution. Now in carrying out an eviction, the special, the relevant circumstances through interpretive processes, uh, 26.3 as read with Pi, you have to give special considerations to the rights of the elderly, children, disabled persons, and women-headed households. So, for example, before you go to Mokuru, you go to court, you make your application for eviction. The court is required to look at the circumstances, the relevant circumstances. Do we have elderly persons here? Do we have the disabled? Do we have children? So that when you give your order as a judge or as a magistrate, you ought to have given cognizance to these special circumstances. So, South Africa, go get orders. In Kenya, Tangalia Mbele, Serikali Mesema, orders from above. Eh? Now, section 4 of PI, again, mirroring section 26.3 of the Constitution, all orders must be sanctioned under a court order. The landlord has to go seek that order in court. The occupier has to enter appearance. Uh, it's quite an elaborate and lengthy procedure. I will not go through it. But what you need to know and apply is that the indigent, the poor people, are entitled to legal aid. So if you're a poor person and you're facing eviction, you've been served with, a court, with court processes. Under PI, you are entitled to legal aid. And we have 
quite a number of law firms and civil society organizations in South Africa that are giving uh, poor people uh, services, legal services, pro bono, when faced with illegal eviction. Now, the jurisprudence oh, uh, around eviction in South Africa is quite rich. I will mention a, a number of cases. Now, we have the case of Ngomani and others versus the city of Johannesburg. This is one important case in terms of eviction orders. We have another case, G's Provincial Minister of Cultural Affairs and Sports, Western Cape and others. This is a 2017 case. G's, G's is spelled as G -E, e S. We have another case, City of Johannesburg, Metropolitan Municipality versus B, B is B H double -E, E, Moonlight Properties, PTY Limited, and another. This is a 2012 case. We have another case on Ndlovu versus Nkobo. Ndlovu versus Nkobo is a 2003 case. Now, these cases are important for this reason that they emphasize that the judiciary will be mandated, will be obligated to deal with eviction matters. So we will not run away from eviction questions. Eh? My good brother, Mr. Nyanje, eh? the so-called judicial restraint, eh? you are not going to run away from eviction matters. You will deal with it head on. So this raft of cases obligate the judiciary to be hands-on. Two, these cases also mandate that the special considerations under PI must be adhered to. The rights of the elderly, the rights of children, the rights of persons with disability, households headed by women. Now what happens like in the Kenyan context, whereby court orders are flouted with impunity. We have what we call a mandamus van spoli. Mandamus van spoli. This is a remedy available to unlawful occupiers when they are forcefully removed by an owner or by the government without a court order. So when, like in our country, uh, people think that they are laws unto themselves and we can do what we want because we have the power of the gun, Mandamus Van Spoli is available to you in South Africa. So that if you lose items in the context of eviction, the remedy of Mandamus Van Spoli, a common law remedy, will be available to you. And you can read the case of Sewelope. Se, Se we, sorry, Sewelopele. Um, this is a South African word, forgive me. Sewelopele, non profit organization versus the city of Swane, metropolitan municipality. Sewelopele, non profit organization, and others versus the city of Swane. Metropolitan Municipality. This is a 2007 case. In this case, the court ordered the municipal government of Swane to replace items lost by victims of illegal eviction. So you come and my items are lost, you will compensate me as government. What a beautiful place to live in. The Constitutional Court in South Africa has also waded into this issue. You will read this in our paper. I don't want to go through it, but you will look at it when uh, we analyze the case of occupiers of Avon uh, Berea versus Divet. This is a 2000 case. And basically, this case and the case of the mayor of Equatini basically emphasize personal accountability of municipal and state uh, government officers. So that if you come and evict 
people, contrary to orders issued by court. In our case here, Justice O'Congo gives orders. And nonetheless, you think you have big arms and you're strong and you can do what you want. You will be held responsible as an individual. We will deal with you. Contempt. We will fine you. And this is perhaps a deterrent measure for government officials who hide behind the so-called orders from above. In summary, if we make a comparison between the South African and um, uh, uh, Kenyan context, in Kenya, the eviction is an ad administrative procedure. The National Land Commission, the county commissioner, or the individual owner issues the eviction order. And after the lapse of the three months, you can proceed to evict. It's, it's a little bit of a gray area in terms of, do we need to go to court? I'm told my time is out. In terms of the South African context, it must be sanctioned by a court order. Failure to abide by the procedures under the Pi Act may lead to fines and criminal sanctions. So that is the distinction between the Kenyan context and the South African context. Ladies and gentlemen, the discussion is much more. You will look at it when we do our final paper. Thank you very much. For myself, and Professor Lumumba. We I think this is the time to open up uh, the discussion for a few questions before we break up for tea. Um, so you can direct your questions to any of the three presenters. It can be a question, it can be a comment of any nature of any form. Uh, I think yeah, yeah, before I come to Ogata, maybe I can just make my comment. Um, Evans Ogata, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. That comparative study of um, the um, enforcement of social economic rights, particularly the right to housing. Um, I think probably would have had wanted to hear more. I mean, the right to housing is quite unique from, for example, the right to health. Um, yeah, and for that matter. But then as enforcement may vary. Enforcement of these fundamental of these rights may vary depending on context. Um, for example, where people are, are deprived of adequate housing uh, or there are no housing at all, it's different from when the court is giving restraining orders against the evictions. Um, so, in cases where there is an affirmative action on the on the part of government, what do you see to be the foreseeable challenges? What do, what is it that would be the foreseeable challenges? Um, the question of foreseeable challenges has always been there in terms of what kind of the appropriate remedies should the court issue. You know, this, this kind of remedy that you're talking about is what we call monologic uh, uh, orders or remedies or reliefs, where the court just issues an order and stops there and expect that the order should be obeyed. But in circumstances where, because social economic rights are, are, are diverse, right to health, you know, right to food, uh, where people are facing serious deprivations. People are living out there in the cold. The court has issued orders that the government should construct those orders. Should those orders be adequate? What are some of the uh, uh, the remedies? I know the Supreme Court um, was confronted with this question in uh, Me to Bell. And uh, one of the issues there was whether uh, structural uh, interdicts, which is a form of dialogic um, uh, order that courts can issue, really have a place in our constitutional order. Um, and I think the Supreme Court was right uh, to make uh, the clarification that, yes, under the... Um, this is a comment. This is not a question generally. Under the, um, I think, Article 23, which provides for any other uh, appropriate remedies, the court has got leverage of power, discretion to, uh, to make any other appropriate remedies. But I think the court did not go deeper into an analysis of what structural interdicts are. And I think when you're pointing at that contradiction in the, um, in the judgment of the court, that is very natural. There are times when our courts are not, at least uh, uh, Justice Washila should have been here. 
they are not deep enough. There are certain questions of great or significant jurisprudential import that they need to deeply probe, but I think they missed that occasion. But even explaining what structural interdicts are. Um, yeah, that is my comment for now. But I think the challenge has also moved in socioeconomic social rights jurisprudence. The real controversy has since ceased from being that of enforcement to come into that of compliance. Um, uh, of course, I'm glad that you pointed out uh, the, uh, or you were about to point out the jurisprudence from Colombia. That's probably if you can go into the question session. The jurisprudence of Colombia, and there's a, an, a, a great deal of writing by a guy called Cesar Rodriguez Garavit, plus others. For a long time, the question or the challenge has been that of enforcement. How do you enforce uh, our rights uh, which go into uh, or provide remedies for polycentric questions or programmatic actions of government? And that's why they had to come up with these structural interdicts or, or, uh, or um, um, what they call dialogic remedies. But then, the, then the, still the controversy or the difficulty still is, or the obstacle still is, how to comply with these orders, you know? Uh, probably you can tell us more um, with the compliance and the enforcement uh, chasm that is there in such a community rights jurisprudence. The first question goes to Dr. Paul again. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, evictions is a very motive motive and complicated uh, area of law, uh, mainly because um, there's that competing interest, private property for private land, or, and that right to housing, which is an obligation for government. I was very interested to find out that, con that, that comparative uh, analysis you did, uh, particularly because of judicial review. Uh, is your argument that judicial review will improve uh, or will stop evictions? Because they experience in this country, and you gave an example of a case in Karyobangi, where even an injunction uh, or issued by the courts uh, was not followed, and the eviction was brutal during the rain, and, and you, you know all that. So just having that uh, judicial review in law is that your proposal or is that your, the crux of your argument? Because that is the main issue that came from your comparative analysis. Thanks. Uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, so um, my question is directed to my learned senior, John Nyanje, who gave quite a, an elaborative um, you know, discussion on um, the impacts of COVID-19 on legal education. And this is very interesting to me because I actually uh, did the same uh, discussion, which I'll be presenting later. But um, I'd just like to hear his views um, on what approach he would believe or he would think um, Kenya should adopt uh, in terms of uh, the effects that you've seen in the current legal education dispensation. Basically what I'm asking is, we've seen that COVID-19 has been a crisis uh, in terms of legal education. You've talked about the quality of legal education, but we've also seen that COVID-19 has led to an opportunity for technological in innovation in legal education. We've seen online learning that you've talked about. Um, but I felt like your paper was more, or your study was quite uh, more shifted towards the negative impacts of COVID-19 uh, on legal education. So would you, would you, uh, you know, would you argue that COVID-19 has actually expanded the opportunity to innovate or to, to, you know, elevate legal education in terms of technology? And do you think Kenya should try as much as possible to improve on technology and that we should embrace these technological in innovations in legal education, or would you suggest that we should go back to the traditional methods of teaching and that COVID-19 has actually led to deleterious effects to legal education and that we should stop these online methods of teaching and that we should embrace those traditional methods of teaching because the quality of legal education has been impacted. So I'd just like to hear your views on which approach 
you'd rather uh, adopt. Thank you. Oh, there's a question here. Yeah. yeah. Um, my question goes to my learned friend who was uh, spoken about um, uh, legal education in the times of COVID. Um, I have two questions. Um, what is the quality of uh, education, legal education, um, when we go through online? Does the quality deteriorate or uh, well, according to your research? And another question is um, the, the, the question of justice or uh, equality when we are uh, shifting our learning to the online uh, mode because not all of us have smartphones or uh, have access to laptops or personal computers or uh, even internet. Um, so did you get that there is an injustice that arises when we go to the online mode instead of the physical mode? And so how should we deal with that? Thank you. Uh, let's take one last, then we will do deal with others in the next round of questions. Uh, I have questions for first for Uganda, and my question is specifically relating to the solutions. I know you didn't get to present your entire paper, but I would like to to hear more about the specific solutions that you do think would address this and how they would be implemented if it's terms of holding the particular police officers accountable for the losses it cost, uh, how would that work rather than just as a theoretical notion? How would it work in the practical sense? Now, uh, the next question is for the legal education authors and presenters. And my question is, to what extent have the local solutions? Uh, because I had, there was a mention of Zoom, there was a mention of Microsoft Teams, there was a mention of how, and how some of these uh, LMS, the learning management systems are unsuited for legal education and more headed towards the mathematics end. So my question was, and I also heard that uh, MKU spent almost 50 million in the switch. So what I wanted to know was what, what was implemented in the local solution sense? What was taken from the local solution and implemented over this COVID phase? Or do we just rely on the exported uh, technological tools and try to work with them? I'd like to hear more about that. Thank you. Okay, let's give the first chance to Ogada to respond. Allow me to start with the first question first, the practical um for us to go to the practical, away from the lofty theory. Uh, if you gathered from the tone of the presentation, we moved away from the theory, we were talking practicals. Now, in terms of the way forward, we need to have a serious national dialogue. When I started out, I spoke of Costa Rica in the 1990s, doing away with its standing army and redirecting the resources to social welfare of the citizens. The problem with African countries, Kenya included, is the neglect of the social welfare capacity of the state. In Scandinavia, uh, because they have a much deeper social uh, welfare culture, taxes will go up to 60, 50 percent. But that deduction in terms of taxes is complemented by government meaningfully providing for the social com component of the state and nobody quarrels. So we have neglected it. Do we need to be recruiting uh, soldiers every year? And in Africa, the military is for regime maintenance. We need to ask ourselves, do we need the 40 plus county governments? And some of the counties are small enough to be uh, villages. Do we need a huge bureaucracy in government? We can downsize that 
and prioritize our resource allocation to what matters. Our people cannot live worse than horses, worse than animals, live in conditions deplorable, worse than pigsties. And yet we call ourselves a government. Eh? Dr. Paul Ogendi. Judicial review is a check and balance scheme. It is only one of those methods towards the re realization of dignity as captured in Article 10 as a principle and or national value. And principle appears again at Article 28 as a constitutional right. So, a multi-sectoral involvement will demand that in addition to us having that national conversation and reassessing our allocation as a country to what matters in terms of priority, let us have the judiciary coming in through judicial review, structural interdicts, and other rem remedies that can be conjured through Article 23 of the Constitution, for example, and Mitubel uh, touched on it. So it's a broader multi-department conversation that needs to be had with government and must involve the citizenry. If we have to stop this uh, bad habit of evictions and the neglect of uh, the welfare component. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for your questions, my brother uh, at the back here. Uh, this is my response in a very simple way. I, I don't clap for authorities that do the bare minimum. So I will not, you know, spend a lot of time in my research paper, you know, saying uh, universities have, you know, they put technology which is important to them. In any event, they were supposed to be doing this ages ago, and they waited for the pandemic. So I, I don't find it useful in my paper, you know, spending time saying this is what works and this is good for universities, which is something they should have been doing. The issue here is to highlight what is problematic about that online teaching. And, and express it. I'm not saying there are no good things about it. But those good things, if you think about them, are things that should have been done a long time ago. And so I didn't find it useful. And maybe, you know, it might be seem negative, but that's the truth. Because why would we spend research time and resources saying this works? You know, a small part works. What is the effect of that research then, if, 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 if it is, you know, impacting on it? Because Universities and law schools had to have partnered with technological companies before the pandemic. It is, it, it is, it is just logic. Many people do it out there. Tech companies are always you know, building new partnerships with law schools for building new treaties and agreements in terms of you know, technological advancement and teaching and you know, encouraging a lot of innovation. This was not happening until the pandemic. And I don't think this is you know, something you know, to, to spend a lot of time in writing, praising universities for it. And that's my opinion about it. Uh, on, 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 on the question of the quality of education and deteriorating. The quality of education, unlike my brother who's presented in, in terms of, you know, the exam results were much higher at Kenya School of Law, I think we need to think it deeper. Were they much higher because people were taught online? Or were they much higher because there was pressure from a certain other institutions, including parliament, on why people are failing at Kenya School of Law? The quality of education has not been great at this online teaching. And, and the survey we, we conduct shows this. Everyone is complaining about it, including academics. They're saying, we don't think we have given our best. And so the best way is to, you know, wh wherever the pandemic takes us, whether it's five years or 10 years, we must just think in terms of, you know, where are we going? Whether we'll go back to fully physical in future, I don't know if that will work. And I don't think we should do that anyway. Because look at it this way. We only have one Kenya School of Law, right? Where you, if you come from Turkana or you come from Kuala like I do, you have to you know, come to that Kenya School of Law. And, and this blended learning has shown that it's not a must that you do it. Okay? It's, it's not a must to do it. So does the Kenya School of Law want to you know, use this as an opportunity to establish centers around where people can do their online learning and go maybe take the exams at those centers around or you know, tutorial centers in in different areas. And so I don't think it will ever go back to what it is, but we just need to have, you know, a, a, a divisive method of, of, of agreeing on what is 
you know, working and what is not working. On justice and equality, I agree with you, my brother, to the, to, to, to the, to, to, you know, you know, to the core, because there's a problem of inequality in this country, yeah? and it's and, and the and the, the gap in in terms of the have and the have nots in this country is huge, and this goes to the nitty gritties of even the legal education education training. You have law schools in this country where students go to the Nuremberg Tribunal and 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 the and the and the, and the PCA at the Hague. Uh, and 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 uh, and Villa Monnier in Geneva to see how the WTO works, and there are students who 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 don't even go to to you know to, go to parliament in law schools in Kenya, and the gaps are, are are big, and we know those schools, right? And and this is is something that you know we need to 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 relook at in terms because these who are going to all these Nuremberg places they. They have the chance to, you know, to engage in all these technological advancements and have all, you know, all the success. And I mean, look at it like I was saying. There's students, law schools that have, don't have even access to Lexis Nexus, one of the most basic research, you know, engine sites. And then you have schools that have access to, you know, all all the thing, all all, all what they want. So the, the the inequality gap is a problem. It has to be filled. Whether that money will come from institutions independently. It's something I, I I really I really don't know, but they have to be filled because at the end of the day, after we get them from the Bachelor of Law program, we have to put all this inequality together at a class in the Kenya School of Law, and and that is just in itself problematic. And if there's going to be a pre bar exam for the Kenya School of Law, then you know who is going to get in and who's not going to get in, and and that is something we have to deal with. Thank you, Moyomba Fed uh, from Mount Kenya University. I'll address, uh, I believe, three questions. Quality of education during COVID, I'll say it dipped, but as we stabilize, it will improve. I do not believe the, the reduction was because of uh, necessarily COVID, but because of accessibility of gadgets and utilization of the same. If we as staff are not familiar will definitely not be able to utilize the facilities well. But uh, as you expect, whenever a new program is introduced, there will always be some, some challenges. Uh, one campus in particular, student protested when the university was reopening and they, they said we shall reopen virtually. The student actually protested. Is there injustice in lack of gadgets? Definitely, yes. It's the duty of some stakeholders, be it government or institutions, to find the mechanisms to ensure all students it admits have access. Uh, if students can pay a certain amount of fee for, for legal education, systems should be put in place to... In, you know, sometimes it's very easy for a parent to pay fees but not buy a laptop so, or a phone, a smartphone. So it's, it's easier for, us, for, 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 for an institution, for example, to say either this is mandatory or, you know, it's part of the package. Uh, that way, we don't uh, disadvantage uh, students who come from poorer background. Someone wanted to know how, or rather, what, uh, how useful was the 50 million spent by MKU in infrastructure. Yes, uh, as a result of that investment, which was quick, uh, tailor-made program in teams was uh, achieved, which enabled uh, uh, exams to to continue online, class to be continue online, and most importantly, despite that challenge, I think something good came out of it. Uh, MKU was able to launch the master's LNM program during COVID, which means uh, sometimes taking advantage of the challenges, you can actually see a silver lining out of every challenge. And in conclusion, definitely blended is the way. I think I talked about graduation earlier, I don't want to repeat. But uh, moving forward, for us, we think uh, we, we will not, we can't go back. Uh, probably uh, doing a, a blended system is the way. Thank you. Um, my question goes to my, my teacher at the University of Nairobi, Evans Ogada. And during your presentation, the 
perception that I got was uh, it was rather a sympathetic tone and uh, largely came out of the view that uh, people being evicted or that the evictees were victims, indigent victims. But we do know that uh, the scenario, some cases on the ground is where uh, the evictees are actually the aggressors. We have uh, many cases in Kenya where landowners and uh, uh, squatters have actually, landowners have been victim to squatters or illegal cabals that have actually s sold off land that is not theirs, offering protection, offering uh, land to people at a cost and hiding behind these court processes, hiding behind these procedures to continue to profit from land that is not theirs. And what you're proposing would actually provide uh, a leeway for these people to continue to hide behind these procedures and continue to c continue to derive the actual owners of the land or p potential beneficiaries of land settlement schemes from their own rights to dignity, for their own rights that are enshrined under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So is what you're proposing intended to be a blanket sort of thing where it provides an opportunity for these people to hide behind, or is it going to be tailor-made? And if so, how is it going to be made such that it only it only provides a tool that victims, genuine victims, can use or exploit for themselves? Thank you. In addition to what the last speaker just said, Ogana, you 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 have some thinking to make. Um, sometimes you find evictees in public land who actually plan to acquire rights, as he says, on that public land, and they go and settle there with their families. And even if they are given notice, they say they have nowhere to go. So, wanakuwa na kichongumu. Just that's the way the government says, or some people say, political problems have political solutions. Now, in this case, you're so sympathetic with them, to the extent that you want to use the court orders as um, a way to give them some rights or assign them some interests. Now, so I look forward, I want to read your paper, I want to see what solution you have on the Kichwangumus, particularly on public land, and sometimes even on private land. Um, you go along the road, you find somebody has just put on a, a shelter there, and they say they have nowhere to go. Give us land. Yet he knows very well this is public land. This is land meant for a road or a school or a dispensary, something like that. So please be 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 neutral. Thank you. I have a question for Gade. Uh, so, so this is what I, I, I see from your paper. You, you are you are you are looking at this evictions on a positive obligation of of the state to stop them, right? But what about the the negative obligations sometimes on a state to uh, enforce some evictions, uh, and the state refuses on them? Because I I think we it. it Sometimes this disobedience of court orders is also limited to, to situations. So take this example that Ambrina Manji gives in her book here of an embassy uh, that acquired uh, uh, land illegally. Our land was transferred to an embassy illegally. And of course, we know which embassy is that. That is near Islam in Nairobi. And people were in that land. And even though the embassy acquired that land illegally, when they want, you know, to remove the people there, they go to court. They, they, you know, the court says, of course, there is a problem in terms of legality of 
the embassy itself, but then the government has to enforce the evictions because once it becomes diplomatic property, then there is a fight of in between whether the government should keep that you know diplomatic property and give it to the proper diplomatic embassy and at the same time protect its citizens from being evicted on such a land. So whether those conflicts, what will the government do, for example? Uh, my brother, I happen to have taught you. Remind me your name. Aaron. Aaron, once a teacher, always a teacher. There's a book called uh, The Struggle for Land and Justice in Kenya by my friend, uh, Professor Ambrina Manji. It's uh, published by the B British Institute of East Africa, BIA. Uh, if that book is available, if it's not available, let me know. It's a must read for anybody who wants to understand the land question in Kenya. The land question in Kenya is one of the inchoate reforms. And at in some point, deliberately so. It's been frustrated by the interest owners in this country. You can see that problem manifesting around uh, Laikipia, the Nainyuki area. We placed some band-aid solution on that question, but it will fester on. We need to address land. And part of the solution that the Constitution envisages is equitable sharing of land resources in this country. We have a bill that has been pending for quite some time, the minimum and maximum land holding acreage uh, bill 2015. There's a reason why that bill has stalled where it has stalled, because certain people do not want to respect the equitable sharing of land in this country. So let's start that conversation from there. Now, in terms of the indigent and the poor, I am not saying that the court will always shelter those that are trying to flout the law, those that are trying to illegally occupy and illegally acquire land. The court process, and to use language favorite with my brother Maxwell Miyawa Daktari, the court is prophylactic. It's a stop, step, it's a stop gap measure so that we don't descend into anarchy and brute force that can be exhi exhibited by African governments, the court mediates the process. It ensures that dignity and proper sanity is respected when we are getting these people out of land. So that we don't have baba, we don't have police boots on your neck in the morning. Eh? Bibiangus kumoja umepata me furushwa She's naked, she's hounded out of her bedroom in the morning in the name of getting evictees out of public land. It's not proper. Let's have it dignified. And the court supervises it, gives it an order, like in the South African case. I hope I've answered the question. My brother Nanje, in terms of the negative obligation, I think I've responded to it. What we need to do is to have sanity. There are procedures under 156, uh, under the Land Act. Let's just follow those procedures and bring in some more with uh, the spirit of the Constitution informing this, perhaps bringing in the aspect of court sanction orders. We will have sanity so that we avoid this brute gang ho force exhibited by government when it comes to eviction. Dignity of the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I would try to utilize the 15 minutes. I work in the Ministry of Interior and uh, listening to the previous presentations, um, we, I am part of the duty bearers that we've been talking about. And uh, let me say that uh, <clears throat> when COVID-19 came in, I was stationed at the County Commissioner's Office in Akuru, um, specifically the one who was issuing travel documents. So you can imagine we have over 2 million people in Akuru, 2.1 million in Akuru. And there are those people who are going for medical services in Nairobi, in Moi Referral Hospital. So I used to issue and it would be very hectic. So COVID-19 came in when people went home 
I've heard people saying we were working from home. It became very hectic for us because of the programs that were running, we were implementing them. So it was a risky uh, uh, point uh, because we interacted now with the, what happened immediately, what happened after, and what is still happening. So my paper focuses on operationalizing the right to social security as a strategy for rebuilding an equal and just uh, society in the post-COVID pandemic. And uh, I want to welcome you in the journal that uh, was launched yesterday, my first paper on the role of national government uh, in AJS, implementing AJS policy was well presented last time. So I welcome you when you access the journal, you can also read it, it is there. And uh, the human rights, as we have been told, and we know it's an entitlement uh, for every person. And uh, this has been severally mentioned in Article 43 of our Kenyan constitution. And uh, it states that every person has the right to social security. And Article 43, 3, that uh, Professor Lumumba's uh, paper also stated, it is stipulated that uh, the state shall provide appropriate social security to persons who are unable to support themselves uh, at their dependence. We are talking about unemployed elder pa elderly pers persons. Uh, we are talking about... Uh, uh, we have vulnerable children, what we call OVCs, orphans and vulnerable children. And uh, social security systems are kind of a societal investment. You invest in the societal capital, whereby uh, you provide this, uh, what is required for the population, especially the masses. And in the 2001 International Labor Conference, Social security was recognized as a vital part uh, of government policy to ensure social cohesion and peace. That explains why, why do we have more mass revolutions in Bodeni, in Mukuru, Kwajenga, but not in Milimani. It's because of the needs of those people. It, it, it directly affects the peace and social cohesion. And in developed nations, social security systems they cover people who are in need of form of assistance like loss of income, health, need to care for children, and we also have elderly persons. We have a lot of homes for elderly persons in those developed uh, nations. Move to the next slide. Inequality in the Kenyan society. And uh, it, during COVID-19, this now was a time to expose the gross inequality in our societies, whereby, and, and you understand in the first phase where there was lockdown for five counties, uh, those in Nairobi and Nakuru was affected. Kenya, uh, Kenya was not able to implement a full lockdown. Otherwise, if, we, if our social security net was good, it, we, it deserved a total lockdown. There should, no, there should not have been any movement, inter-county movement, but this was not possible because our economy does not support that as it now. And uh, over 83% of the working population uh, is in the informal sector. The border, the, uh, the, the mamabogas, those people in informal settlements cover 83% of our national GDP. What does that mean? These individuals survive hard to mouth, so they have to work. And uh, they have to work to get food for their families. And the impact of COVID-19 had serious ramifications in the Kenyan society. Let me tell you, when COVID-19 came in, as I told you, we were left in the office. I would find women coming with their children to my office. And they are telling me these children have not eaten for two days. We have been locked down. We had cases of COVID-19 in our plot. The public health that came in and, and told us to isolate. And this is a lady, I remember one of them, goes to Nimamafua, anaenda kifua nguo, di analipu wa miambili. So the people in the rich environment were not ready to take these women. They are bringing COVID. You remember that scare? You don't accept even 
you are gardener to come because he will come to infect your children. So they were left helpless. And they would come and we would start searching for where to, to get food for them. So these experiences of COVID-19 are a wake-up call, according to my paper, for the country to re-examine re the social security system. And uh, this study sort, I, I conducted a study between 4th of October to around 14th of November. It is sought uh, to explore the ways in which the country can operationalize citizen right to social security as a strategy to, be, to rebuild uh, an, uh, an equal and just society. A specific objectives, I mean, the next slide, uh, Mwiruri. Specific uh, uh, objectives, uh, as stipulated, ex examine what are the existing social security programs in Kenya and what are the challenges in implementing them. Then, what are the strategies to enhance effectiveness in those programs? And uh, the research methodology um, employed. I did a phenomenological uh, study, and uh, this is whereby I was able to uh, to interview officers in the Ministry of Labour uh, who ha who are the cur currently implementing some social uh, development programs. And these social development programs include like cash transfer for the orphans, for the elderly persons. Um, and then uh, school feeding programs in some urban areas. We have NHIF is also a scheme and NSSF. So I limited myself to that because of time. And uh, the, the, this, uh, I was able to interview um, some officers from uh, Ministry of Social Services and the Department of Children Services, NHIF and NSSF. And uh, so, this, the, so this study basically examines the experiences of government officials who implement social security programs. And I was able to reach out uh, to about 11 of them um, using a snowballing uh, uh, method whereby one would refer me to the other. My colleague is in this office, including here in Naivasha, I was able to um, examine some officers who work in this sub-county. And the results were overwhelming. I know we are, all of us have experienced NHIF or we have heard about it. And NHIF, um, this is a scheme that is uh, run by the Kenyan government to provide health insurance, which is contributory and targets all the beneficiaries. And uh, it, it targets Kenyans above 18 years. This is a contributory scheme. The challenges, low income within the population that I'm talking about, that is the poor, inadequate health infrastructure. We keep complaining our health facilities do not have enough drugs. It's, um, lack of drugs in some, completely in some facilities. And uh, because of time, I want to do the recommendations even per uh, challenges and recommendations at the same time. And the, subs uh, the recommendations for this, as got from the officers implementing, is sub subsidizing like NHIF you, you tell uh, Mama Boga who is selling nyanya in the market is she able to contribute 500 per month? If not, can government come in and do part contribution on the same so that we can have universal health care, improve health care uh, infrastructure, um, then enha enhance monitoring. Uh, NSSF, I was also able to visit uh, officers from NSSF and the National Social Security Fund. This one is a, a fund provided to employers and to workers, uh, to employees or workers. You, you know that some, some people lost jobs. Um, so they didn't have this scheme and they were also affected as workers. So the, for former employees, NSSF is uh, compulsory, um, and the benefits paid on, we have withdrawal from active work under the age of 50. Then, uh, he has moved in and my lot of, is not, okay, 
So uh, then we, you can actually get part payments, which is also acceptable. And I want to state that there are several challenges in the implementation of NSSF, like lack of awareness. Very many people don't really understand NSSF. And if they understand, they are not really able even to know how they can be able to digitally access to know the amount of contributions they have made. And there is also negative perception. Some people say, why should I save for uh, when I retire? Very negative perceptions. But these are social security nets that, if well implemented, can be able to, to help uh, in cautioning the effects of COVID-19 and other pandemics. Competition from other schemes and low contribution amounts. This is discussed in my full paper. And uh, for recommendations, I stated that uh, create awareness, just move to the next slide, uh, registration, the other previous slide. So we, we, we create awareness, train contributors. If we are trained well, if we train the workers well, they will be able to, uh, to understand the reason for, for saving. You could, you could move next slide so that I can, I don't want to move through all of them. Uh, cash transfer programs. I have five minutes. So the challenges is inadequate resource for cash transfer, delays in registering new members. You know cash transfer, ni ile tunasema inua jami, pesa ya waze. And I think you've seen around even on the news how um, it's a good scheme if well managed. And if we have enough resources, uh, we have not been able to register elderly persons from 2017 because of budgetary issues. Um, recommendations are there. Number four you know, is on school feeding program, which has recommendations and challenges have highlighted. Before my last slide, because I have three minutes, I want to show you a real picture of Kazim Taani. Kazim Taani came in immediately after, <clears throat> in May last year. I think maybe if you work, if you, uh, you pass by some of those slum areas, it was a, a, a program financed through Kenya Urban Support Program, whereby it was, the government was channeling money directly to those people, those young people, those women who lost casual jobs. When markets were closed, and uh, they had to feed their children. So I want Wanyoike to kindly run through. I just want to give you a few examples from Nakuru town where I was involved. We had, we employed 14,500 casual workers from the 11 sub counties. And uh, it was a good, uh, during that period, although the, 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 the program was suspended June this year because of budgetary allocations, it's now coming uh, up as a second phase we had success stories. You could hear a, a lady comes and tells us, I was a hockey. And when the market was closed, I didn't have food. The landlord sent me off because they were coming to our office. Then we would take that data through chiefs and the Nyumbakumis. They would, oh my, don't let it go because I have three minutes and I want, I just picked a few so that I can go to my conclusion slide such that we were able to employ them. They would be paid 455 shillings per day. They were paid every two weeks. And they gave us, after the completion of the uh, program, we, count, we recounted and we were able to record some of those success stories. And uh, the stories were overwhelming. Technical hitch, uh, Dr. Tari, he just give me two more minutes, he opens up. And uh, they were able to tell us, uh, I had accumulated rent of five months, but since Kazim Tani came in, uh, I was able to pay the rent. I was able to feed my children. I was able to start small businesses. And those are just examples of what the government can do even going forward post COVID-19 to bring such, a, I don't know, Wanyoike, as he, he opens, let me just, go through what I have, but I wish, you know, you know, in uh, adult learning, visual is more recommended than 
Yes, in adult learning, that is, uh, people need to see. They remember more. Adults remember more what they see than what they hear. So in, uh, I said in Akuru County, we employed 14,000. And I have, I, had, I, I have a few recordings and a few photos of what they were able to do. Like I have a, a group of young men. These young men were in Flamingo Slum in Nakuru Bodeni. And they were able to, after the, 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 the stipend they got from Kazimtani, within the group, we would talk to them and train them. We were bringing officers to train them on how they can start small businesses. Um, about the, uh, a few of them, 32 of them formed a group they call Framison Garbage Collector. They identified a problem in Flamingo Slum where the county government was not correcting enough, uh, was not correcting garbage. And they came up and started uh, moving around. Go to Flamison, the, uh, on top there. They were able now to come up with, to provide a solution to the community as they also get their daily stipend. And it, is all, it was a multiplier effect. They get 455 paid by the, uh, by the Ruka Zimtani. They form a group and they start cleaning a slum where they live. And this was welcome because the county government was not able to, to collect garbage. You can go to next uh, slide on... Uh, Joyce Wairimo is a lady who was a hawker. She lost job while she was paid the first 2000 because they were 2,000 per week. They were being paid 2,000 per week. She started, she bought some detergents. And she started mixing chemicals. And now, she, we ring her even to hotels in Kano Street. And now she supplies in those hotels. So that's a sustainable way of how government can use this social security. Um, uh, the social skills that these people in the rural, uh, in the urban setup have, even for better sustainability. There is another lady by Elizabeth Kemani who sells hard bag. This is a lady, a young lady, to about 25 years old, a diploma holder in sales and marketing. She, when she was paid, she started uh, buying some hard bags and she would sell online. And that became her means of, that's what she's doing up to today. So the stories are several. I had highlighted several. If you are interested, you can be able to run them through. On, in conclusion, I have several of them. There are about 50 slides there, but because of time. Why am I bringing this? So that we have a solution even to people who currently have no social security net. But this, uh, if we, the programs are tailored towards meeting the specific need of people, uh, it can be, it can solve the problem. Conclusions is not that the study has established that most social security programs are tax financed. Uh, mainly uh, in the form of non-contributor, like the cash transfer. You, you have to get it from the tax to pay. So me and you have to pay tax for them too. But if they are contributor, if they are made contributory, it can be very effective and long-lasting. According to Woods, a sustainable universal social security is best established through strengthening social solidarity. I think there was that... Uh, 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 we, we received that presentation yesterday and the study recommends that the country should move away from the tax financed scheme and place more emphasis on contributory schemes such as NSSF, NSSF and others that can come up and uh, in addition the study has observed that the country has no social security program for protecting citizens against employment unemployment or loss of income. That was experienced firsthand. And that's why currently you hear now the current politicians running for presidential, they are telling us about bottom up, top down and 6,000 stipend. Why? Because we don't have a social security program currently for unemployed youths. Such programs would have come in handy during the COVID-19 pandemics and uh, so this study suggests that the country should explore this avenue. And I want to add by a quote uh, uh, by a Chinese philosopher who says that in a country well governed, poverty is something to be ashamed of. And in a country badly governed, wealth is something to be ashamed of. Thank you for listening to me. Sorry for taking a few of your minutes. Thank you.
right. Thank you very much, Mary, for your presentation. That presentation shows us that although there are significant problems highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, that there is yet some hope that there is a redemptive turn to the COVID-19 pandemic and that there is a role, there is a potential role to be played by government and other important uh, stakeholders. Now, there's an important uh, announcement uh, relevant to our online uh, participants. We recognize your presence and we encourage you for purposes of uh, asking questions so that this can be fully interactive both here in person as well as on the online space. You're encouraged to send your questions um, and, and or other contributions to the chat section uh, that is available in the, on the online platform on which you are joining us in this discussion. All right, the next uh, presentation is uh, the paper by Diana Andashiki, titled Human Rights Protection in the Context of uh, the COVID-19 Pandemic. That will be followed by another important contribution by Dr. Paul Ogendi, titled Access to Justice and the Health Sector During the COVID-19 Pandemic. So, I have this very colorful presentation for, for us this afternoon. So I changed my topic um, a bit. I'll be presenting on the use of strategic litigation for the protection of human rights during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I wanted to base this on um, the work that we do at Kituo Chasheria and also looking at other um, Mm, human rights organizations and CSOs and how they were able to file uh, public interest litigation or strategic litigation cases um, to protect the rights of, um, of especially the poor and the marginalized uh, groups in society uh, during the pandemic. So first, um, we can describe strategic litigation as the use of an individual or test cases to create um, broader change in the society. So when you go with this one or three cases to court, you're not only seeking redress for these clients uh, that you're representing, you're also aiming to prevent similar injustices from occurring to others in similar circumstances or in the future. Um, so how has it been used? And we'll just look at cases, but um, you can think about this uh, point that I'm mentioning now and see if uh, those cases were able to um, bring out these things. So one, strategic, strategic litigation has been used during the pandemic to trigger discussions and to raise awareness on rights violations. And then... Mm, it has been used to highlight weaknesses and gaps in law, also to expose inequalities in legal systems, and finally to check on administrat administrative excesses. Um, and this last point has been discussed very well uh, in the morning sec uh, session uh, by Ogada, and I'll still go into that area of his presentation when we look at the cases. So yesterday, when we were having tea, um, there's a group that was saying, you will know the difference between a lawyer's presentation and a person who's not a lawyer. They were saying lawyers use cases only. So I'll try to explain the cases so that for the purposes of everyone understanding the presentation. But yes, my presentation will be majorly looking at cases. Um, so yeah, these are the three main cases that we're going to look at and uh, see how um, through these cases we're able to, uh, or CSOs were able to protect human rights during the pandemic. The first one is a Legal Advice Center, uh, trading as Kitocha Sharia and two others versus the Chief Justice uh, and two others, 2020. So 
this case uh, is based on the presentation that um, the um, Honorable um, Judge spoke about yesterday when she was talking about how the judiciary um, introduced ICT and technology in, um, in delivering judicial services to the public. So if you remember in her presentation, she mentioned that there is a group or a very um, a percentage of Kenyans who are actually locked out. Um, and even when we're discussing um, education and legal education, it also came up. Um, without, without realizing or noticing that some, uh, the realities of some of the Kenyan citizens, especially the poor and the marginalized, um, when you're introducing ICT or um, digitalization in, which, in whichever systems, you find that at the end of the day, you end up locking out this group of people. So uh, the background of this case, it's uh, basically that um, the petitioners um, were basically saying without programs, without necessary and adequate programs and initiatives to cover the poor and self-representing litigants, um, they are locked out and they are unable to access justice um, in the country, or I mean in courts. So the Chief Justice uh, was a respondent and also the National Council on the Administration of Justice. And their response was that what they were doing or introducing uh, uh, or let me say digitizing the judiciary in such a hurry was reasonable in the circumstances, it was proportionate and it was constitutional. He have left everyone behind. <laughs> I'm on slide five. Previous one. No. Uh, where it's written, legal advice center, yes. Sorry for that. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, they responded and said that their actions were reasonable, proportionate, and constitutional, and reflective of what everyone else in the world was doing at that particular time uh, during the, okay, it's still during the pandemic. So they also said that um, the petitioners, they, they were not able to prove that anyone has actually been uh, been whose rights has have been infringed by the introduction of technology, but maybe that is just a, a lawyer's ways of trying to defend their case. Because you see, even yesterday they acknowledged that definitely there are people who are actually locked out or whose rights are infringed as a result of not taking into consideration um, that uh, ICT without the right um, programs and initiatives will lock out people. So there was this census that the petitioners used um, and it shows, it shows the reality on the ground because in the 2019 uh, census report, uh, it showed that only 22.6% of Kenyans have access to the internet. That is one in five Kenyans. And then only 10.4% of Kenyans have used a computer in their lives. 10.4%. This is out of 100%. And then 47.6% of the Kenyan population have mobile ownership. That is almost 50%, but still you see there's a 50% who don't even have mobile phones, let alone um, internet. We are not even talking about a smartphone, we are talking about mobile ownership. So looking at this and also looking at the fact that um, there are Kenyans, yes, we've gone to school, but there are Kenyans who are illiterate. There are Kenyans, as I've mentioned, who do not know how to use... Um, who do not know how to use computers, tablets, and they don't have access to that. Some people don't have electricity, let alone the internet. And then, you know, uh, 
to file a case, you need an email. So with those clients, you need to start from scratch, getting their details and creating an email for them. Now on their own, because many of them don't have emails. And then you can say, okay, you do not have internet, go to a cyber cafe. The people who live in the rural areas, they, is, they will not be able to access um, cyber cafes uh, easily or without, um, how can I say? Okay, let me just say easily. They cannot access cyber cafes easily. So that is a huge chunk of, of, of the population. So if we say, okay, now people can access, we, we have a hybrid thing where courts are now being opened to the public, but at that time, so many people were locked out, especially, and yeah, the point the marginalized are usually the self-representing, uh, the self-representing litigants because they cannot afford representation. So you see, these were people who are being locked out from formal justice systems. So yeah, the petitioners claimed um, that cyber cafes and court officials asked for 3,000 from them in order to provide um, the judicial services. And I experienced this because um, I was in the legal aid department um, when, when uh, this um, integration of ICT was brought in the judiciary. And if I was to file a labor case for a client, because um, you see you pay for every, every document, it will be like 1,000 shillings. But then because there are so many clients, you cannot file for everyone. So you tell some, if you're able, go to court or go to a cyber, um, it's going to be faster that way. They go, they come back, and then they say, we were told it's 3,000 shillings. And you see, to us, that might not be a lot of money, but um, the second respondent in uh, this particular case um, claimed that they had not paid their rent for eight months during the COVID period. And do you know, for such clients, their rent is 800 shillings. So where do you expect them to get 1,000, 3,000 shillings to pay for court um, or to continue their case? So these people have to decide either they're feeding their families or they are, um, they are taking someone or they are bringing a grievance uh, uh, justice systems to the formal justice systems I mean mm. so it results in cases that were dismissed for lack of appearance while um, um, yeah generally some Kenyans were locked out and when I say some it sounds like five or ten but it's actually a big number so that is the background of this uh, case and why Kituo went to court to represent these two litigants. As I said, strategic litigation, you take a few, but it's a very big uh, population of people. So, uh, but, um, the judiciary had the best intentions at the time and um, the right to supersedes any other what happened supersedes the right to um, okay so the court held that um the right to life supersedes the right uh, of the petitioners to let's say uh, having the courts opened and any other thing so the foremost what was important first was to prevent the spread of covid and to protect the life the lives of judges staff members and stakeholders and then also they wanted to ensure continuity of dispensation of justice despite despite the circumstances at the moment so they were not trying to discriminate against the vulnerable against the poor um additionally any orders sought um that the the, the measures by the judiciary were against article 48 or 159 or 27 um the court actually uh, rejected that because they said the the judiciary actually introduced 
the practice direction or introduce the CT in the, judi in the judiciary, um, having Article 48 in mind and having Article 159 in mind. So they wanted to protect these provisions and not violate them. However, um, the court held that there was a legitimate expectation created because um, during the launch of the of the judicial of the of the of this ICT in the judicial in the judiciary, the Chief Justice uh, then. Um, David Maraga, when he was during the official, official launch, he made a uh, five minutes. Okay, he when he was launching, he actually said that they are going to the judiciary will try to bring in will accredit cyber cafes and bring in people to assist those who cannot uh, be able to file cases on their own. So because of this, um, the court made an order directing the Chief Justice. To within 90 days um, implement initiatives and programs that will ensure access to courts and services by members of the public and advocates. So this case might, um, with time, now that uh, courts are opening up, you find that it might not be as relevant, but at that moment, um, Kitu was able to protect uh, the rights of the poor and the marginalized. Then next, now I'll rush because I have five minutes only. In this case, the Kibos Nubian uh, community eviction case, um, this matter has been explained in the morning by um, uh, Oda Ogada uh, in his uh, presentation. Um, so the background is that there were so many evictions happening when the pandemic uh, began. We have Ruai, Jiru, Kibos. Kariobangi, it left many families homeless with no alternative uh, resettlement and compensation accorded to them. Um, so it also exposed families and uh, people to the dangers of contracting COVID because they could not access shelter, sanitation services and protection from uh, weather elements. So in this particular case, um, the in summary, the Nubians at Kibos, they actually have a license uh, during their lifetime to settle on the land that they occupy. And they've been there for years and years and years. This license was given to their four, four fathers. But then Kenya Railway Corporation came, gave them a seven day notice. And after that, they destroyed their structures, including schools, houses, water facilities, hospitals, mosques. This was a time students were almost doing examination, so I do not know how they thought that would work. I, I think it has been explained very well in the morning how government institutions sometimes do these demolitions without care or thought uh, of the citizens. So the court held that any forceful eviction and or demolition without relocation of the people is illegal and it violates the petitioner's rights to right of property and they're entitled to um, either property or compensation before relocation. So this is a photo of them when they won. Ah, you, you showed the photo, yes. The last case, um, we know it was the curfew case by the Law Society of Kenya and other interested parties including Kitocha Sharia. So at this time, um, I know we remember um, or a show slide 12 first, just on the same day, I know we all remember seeing this video somewhere or this photo. You remember this guy, this truck driver? <laughs> Thank you for the response. And then the next one, this was in Likoni. Was in Likoni, first day uh, of enforcement of the curfew. It was not even curfew time. Kenyans were just trying to get home before the curfew and then the police decided to uh, make unreasonable force um, upon them. So the Law Society of Kenya uh, with other uh, CSOs went to court um, to try and bring these issues uh, to light and also ask the court to give some relief of some 
thought for team. So they wanted uh, the Inspector General, a declaration of the Inspector General um, and the, the Kenya Police Service were unreasonable in the use of force in enforcing the curfew and it was unconstitutional. Um, on the second relief sought that he be held liable, the court uh, did not ad accept that, um, but it was also one of the prayers. And then they also wanted an inclusion of um, uh, the judicial system and legal representation in the list of essential services providers. So um, at the end of it, uh, 16, the court held that truly um, the force was unreasonable. These people throughout everyone who was either beaten or killed during that time, they were not, um, it was not really, they were not really trying to, to fight back or anything. If you don't have a mask, if you're out at night, you, you also deserve the full process of the law like any other person who has been arrested for any other offense. So, okay, let me just give me like two minutes. So the court gave this declaration, but still, you know, these boys, still um, the police continued to use unreasonable, where are the boys? 17. Yeah, the, um, the police continued to use unreasonable force when handling um, citizens. So... It, uh, strategic litigation has been effective, but with its challenges, we discussed some of them um, in the morning presentations, the last slide. Um, and this includes failure to respect the rule of law, fear of intimidation. Sometimes you don't want to uh, pursue a case because you fear who you are trying to go against in court. Litigation sometimes is expensive. Mm, then failure in enforcement of court orders or lack of proper enforcement procedures. Thank you very much. To, to just start us off, uh, it's important that we've seen how the formal courts were able to solve some of the cases that arose, uh, including in the housing and uh, public order and such other cases uh, that we've uh, been taken through. This is important because uh, in my presentation, I don't focus on the formal courts. Uh, I try to have a situation whereby I look at other institutions, in my opinion, should have played a very important role to increase access to justice. Now, as you're aware, because of the scaling down in terms of uh, operations in court and uh, because of the closures uh, which ordin ordinarily happen when a case is reported, um, we see or we expect that people uh, will have it difficult to get their cases heard and determined. And of course, because of the court's uh, bureaucracy and uh, somebody was just posting on social media that the next available date is in July 2022. Uh, so those inefficiencies ordinarily will not uh, work well with the poor people. So I wanted to find out in my research uh, whether or not uh, the quasi-judicial institutions could play a role, and if at all they played any. Uh, to my surprise, uh, in the health sector specifically, I was able to identify more than five institutions, but uh, I was disappointed to see that uh, very few cases, uh, particularly those related to COVID, uh, had been reported there and handled uh, in that context. Um, it was disappointing. Why? Because COVID, first of all, is a, a health issue and uh, violations in the health sector have been reported widely in the media. So the lack of uh, cases both in court and these quasi judicial institutions was a bit worrying. Uh, and that gives me um, my introduction, so we move on. Now, um, I want to theorize the concept of access to justice and uh, try to give it a context in emergencies or pandemics. 
And uh, from what Ro says, it's it's about fairness of institutions. And if it's about fairness of institutions, uh, what if then is access? Access is about removing barriers. And therefore, in the context of emergencies, uh, the barriers require us to consider creativity, innovation, and adaptation. Uh, and, and I think the previous speaker who was looking at the uh, technology as an enabler had made a good point that in some cases, uh, the poor were not able to benefit from uh, virtual hearings and you know all this. So we need to adapt and adaptation does not mean or is not equivalent to technology. That is one point that people usually forget. It is uh, important, but for the poor who are left behind, it could mean something else. Now, uh, so I think that is it in terms of the theory part. Now, um, we'll move on. So the situation, I think I've already painted uh, the, 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 court, the court system uh, could not deliver uh, on its mandate. Already we have a problem in terms of access to justice in courts. Uh, and therefore, uh, in the context of pandemic, this problem is just multiplied. Uh, uh, and because of this, the expectation is that other bodies or other institutions could play a much higher role. Move on. So what are these bodies? Uh, in the health sector, um, uh, um, the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Council is one very prominent body. Uh, this body is created under Section 3 of the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentists Act. And if you look at the mandate, uh, it has mandate over the registered uh, medical and dental practitioners and also health institutions. That is important because uh, in many cases, there were situations whereby uh, patients or even healthcare providers were complaining about lack of personal protective equipment or, you know, uh, lack of services and, and all this. So this avenue or this body had actually jurisdiction over uh, both the registered medical providers plus the institutions that offer healthcare in the country. And then under the same act, there's a committee which deals with matters uh, about uh, uh, professional conduct. And then uh, any person who has a complaint can, can uh, lodge a complaint. And uh, the council has a way of reissuing a reprimand and other things. Move on. So the first committee that you need to be aware of is the uh, preliminary inquiry committee. So once you make a report at the council, there's usually a process that this goes, uh, that is taken uh, in this case goes through. The first one is that there's a preliminary inquiry committee and it is chaired by the registrar. So the purpose of this committee is to just find out whether your case has a prima facie uh, success rate. So once that has been done, we go to the second, but we have now what you call professional conduct committee. And this is where now the inquiry into the complaint is undertaken and an appropriate recommendation is given. So once you satisfy the preliminary prima facie case, uh, then there is an inquiry that happens. And this happens uh, at the professional conduct committee. In special cases, there is a tribunal. And the tribunal is now the full board of the KPMDC, the council itself. So the tribunal is composed of the full board exercising quasi-judicial functions and to determine disciplinary matters. According to the code, the primary duty of the board sitting as a tribunal is to protect the public and the profession and subject to the above. The board is also to consider what is in the best interest of the doctor or dentist. So you see the mandate of the board is much broader. It is about the public and the profession. So that if a matter happens, which is shocking, eh, and a registered member is involved, 
uh, the board now does not send this matter to the committee, but it sits and then makes a determination. Uh, the board handles cases arising from conviction of a doctor, for example. If you are uh, maybe charged and uh, you are convicted of rape, uh, the board will be required to sit because they need to protect the profession. And uh, other uh, offenses which are categorized as serious professional misconduct. So it is not for all the cases that will go to the tribunal, but those that are relating to the conviction and then the second one is those that are very serious uh, in terms of the profession. Then the all appeals that emanate from the board must be done within 30 days. It is important to note that when you go to that body, after 30 days, arguably, without leave from the court, you are barred from you know, uh, appealing. So what are some of the adaptation? Because we say that our conception of uh, access to justice is not just about technology, it's about creativity, innovation, and adaptation. Um, so the board set up two committees as opposed to the usual one committee. And, and the purpose of these two committees is to try and reduce the number of people appearing before it. Uh, the other thing that is, they did is that uh, they had a call center and uh, this is missing from the presentation, but they used to have only one hearing per day, or in exceptional cases, they could hear two. But in the past, they could sit one day and uh, they finish all the cases they have. But during the COVID situation, they restricted the numbers to one, and in exceptional circumstances, they could only have two cases. And in that uh, regard, uh, they also increase the number of cases, the number of days, eh? as opposed to one day per week. They now had like one week uh, per month to be able to listen to cases. So that means that they increase the number of days and also other things. Also, they did not accept hard copies. You had to file your electronic uh, materials. Uh, cases, unfortunately, they were not related to COVID. They were medical malpractice and negligence cases. Uh, 10 minutes is good. We'll be done by then. Uh, then, uh, in relation to COVID cases, uh, there are many complaints were not about the conduct of doctors. It was about the billing, uh, the cost. The cost of healthcare at the facilities uh, were complained about majorly. And then the management or delays in terms of um, management of patients and then how the delays in hospital happened. Um, but those were some of the uh, cases. But there's also one case which is not here but about uh, uh, a doctor, a health provider who uh, issued some 144 vaccines to uh, an individual in Rwai. And this individual uh, went to Moranga and vaccinated some people. You remember that time when vaccines just came, it was like a silver bullet and everybody with an influence uh, wanted to use uh, or, or take advantage of this. So, so this is one of the cases that was litigated and which is um, in my paper elaborated upon. Uh, but apart from that, uh, uh, because eventually the hospital was closed and then it reopened and then the professionals involved were interdicted and the nurse actually was taken to the nursing council for disciplinary uh, process. So you see that these institutions actually can work uh, in terms of uh, regulating the conduct of health providers and it, in fact, uh, the health institutions. So we move on. The second institution, which is also important is the pharmacy and poison sport. Um, it is important because this is where, you know, regulation of medicine also happens and even vaccines it happens here. And remember, uh, there have been uh, questions about the safety, uh, safety of uh, vaccines uh, that have been raised in public. There have been also other questions about, uh, you know, um, vaccine mandate and all this. Uh, so we expect that as you go to the pharmacy, every hospital has one, particularly uh, those which are well established. Uh, if anything happens to you, uh, and you remember there were those medicines you were given uh, to treat uh, COVID. Uh, 
if it was not approved, yeah, you know, uh, I know Trump used to sort of promote certain medicines in the country before you uh, given this kind of medication. If anything happened to you, this is a body you could consider taking your case. Now, uh, unfortunately, around March 2020, the term of some board members expired, and uh, the minister actually refused to appoint new board members because they wanted to restructure the, the board, and it was very hard for this board to play a role in the context of COVID. So this is one area whereby we see access to justice denied because in the absence of the board, the committee responsible to hear cases cannot handle any cases. So we move on to the Nursing Council of Kenya. Uh, this is also the one that is responsible to look at uh, the standards of nursing profession. And of course, they are also supposed to look at under Section 18F, nurses may be culpable of professional misconduct, including failing to observe and apply professional, technical, ethical, or other standard prescribed by the council as guidelines for practice by registered nurses. So there's usually that uh, um, we forget that the nurses are, are actually, even though they work under doctors and clinical officers, they also have their own code, which is important. So for example, you can be in a hospital, and uh, in most cases, uh, this is the time we saw many people in ICU. So there are ICU nurses, right? If you come and find that your patient is not properly being taken care of by a nurse, uh -huh. then this is a body that you should consider approaching for your case. Then uh, what were the adaptation there? Uh, the council implemented a number of measures, but most importantly, they did not close down. Uh, they did not insist on, and, and all these bodies were actually operating physically. Yeah? I know technology, technology, technology has always been emphasized, but there are other measures you can take. For example, we said the board, the council had many other days to operate and fewer cases. Okay, uh, but the board had only what you call uh, hybrid sittings where the CEO and a few others could sit internally and then the other members could be virtual. And then the room was much bigger. So you see this kind of innovation that we're talking about. So my main aim here is to try and uh, uh, challenge that notion or that virtual is actually now the new norm in COVID. Yeah? There are other things you can do uh, to, to try and provide services, but of course not being able to put our lives at risk. The, the room was bigger for social and all that. So in terms of cases, there were also, regrettably in my opinion, because I was very much interested to know whether there were COVID specific cases, but most of them were just because of uh, uh, malpractice. And uh, two cases were reported during that time uh, the one that I've mentioned about 144 vaccines, uh, the nurse involved was actually interdicted and uh, the process uh, concluded. Uh, the number, the, the two, the number two is not unique. I, I actually asked whether this number, uh, the fewer cases, they said, yeah, you can report on a lot of cases, but only two qualify to be taken for, you know, uh, further. But there were other more cases which were reported, but this is actually ordinary. Uh, so even in terms of crisis, where you expect many cases, because you have more patients accessing health facilities, we don't see any improvement. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's legitimate to expect more, more people to go there. Now, Clinical Officers Council, this is also there. It has the same mandate as the others. Unfortunately, I was not able to uh, interview anyone from this office, and I would be glad if you know of a person who can be able to to, to give me information about what they did in the context of COVID-19 to adapt uh, and provide, you know, the required uh, services in terms of investigation and disciplinary process. But uh, most important is to just know that this body insists. And in many of our primary healthcare facilities, I think level three and below, you will not find a doctor. You'll find clinical officers. So this is important, especially because most poor people actually interact uh, with the clinical officers more than doctors. The next body that I, I didn't know particularly existed is the Kenya 
medical laboratories, technicians, and technology support. Uh, you know, COVID is a lab, a lab issue, yeah? Uh, they used to have that nasal swab, and the nasal swab is taken for testing and other things. Uh, if you have results, and some people used to say that the results were faulty and all this kind of thing, so the appropriate body that would have been responsible to give you assistance is actually the this board. Last body under the health sector is the Central Board of Health. This is for public health officers. This Central Board of Health is actually located at the Ministry of Health uh, because the Ministry is actually the one responsible for public health matters. And uh, for that, uh, it advises the Minister, so it doesn't do much. I am not aware if they have a disciplinary committee, uh, but also for the three bodies, the clinical officers, the laboratory people, and the central board, uh, one of the things I need from you, if you are able to assist, are contacts of people I can interview so that this paper can be complete. Uh, in conclusion, um, access to justice is important, and in terms of crisis, it does not change. Eh? It has to continue. And then downscaling of court operations requires us to also look at other alternatives that are able to provide the same services we are looking for. Uh, and, and I'm thinking in the context of COVID, those health quasi judicial institutions are even much more effective uh, because within months you'll be able to get your, you know, uh, rolling or whatever it is. Uh, many people are obsessed with going to court, but you remember in court, uh, I know the court officers around, you can take even two years, and I don't think that is in your interest, particularly uh, in such cases. Uh, those bodies include the ones I've mentioned, uh, and it's important that we don't uh, forget about them. Uh, that is it. Thank you. <clears throat>